We are thinking of restoring uh, church services at Lord of the Harvest. And in light of that, uh, we want to do a little bit of teaching. We want us to uh, get in the right spirit, the right frame of mind for returning to our corporate gatherings. So the message today is going to be entitled on love during a global pandemic. And we're going to look at a biblical definition of love. We're going to look at several passages from the New Testament. We want to start with the great commandment, and we are going to look at Mark chapter 12 uh, for the great commandment, where Jesus is speaking with a scribe. Mark 12, verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard those reasoning together, perceiving that Jesus had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Now, Jesus answers, which is the first commandment of all, by giving two commandments. Uh, first could also be interpreted greatest. He asks for one great commandment, and Jesus gives two great commandments, although it's really part one and part two of the same commandment. Jesus answered and said, The greatest of all commandments is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. The Lord is unified. Uh, underscoring this, this saying about the Lord is one speaks of the, the, the unity of the Godhead. Of course, in, in New Testament terms, it means that Father, Son, and Spirit are unified. They're not divided and they're not in competition with each other. Uh, looking at it from an Old Testament perspective, to say the Lord is one is that the Lord seeks after unity. He's one with his purposes. He's one with his will and he's one with his people and he would have his people to be one with him and with each other. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God out of or with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, your whole strength. It's complete dedication to the Lord. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, Jesus is saying that there's only one commandment with two parts. It's a very Hebraic way of saying that you can't have the one without the other. To say that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and not to love our neighbors as ourselves, is not to keep the commandment. It means we don't love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and strength. Now, if you look at 1 John, 1 John captures the same idea. In 1 John chapter 3, John says this, 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. The real sign that God's people love him the real sign that God's people have been given new life, have been born again, have been regenerated, the sign of it is not necessarily loving God. It is loving our brother. So there's that part B, the second commandment, if you will, to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now you have to understand the way the Hebrew language works and the way Hebraic thought works. To hate your brother doesn't mean I have these hostile, horrible, terrible, negative thoughts toward my brethren. It means I don't love my brethren. To not love your brethren is to hate your brother. There's not this middle ground that we have in kind of our, our Western way of thinking. There's 
hatred over here, there's love over here, and well, there's something in the middle. I, 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 I neither love nor hate. That's not a Hebraic category. In Hebrew, either you love your brethren, or if you don't love your brethren, you hate your brethren. And that's the point John is making here. Love is something active. It's not an absence of hate. It's not a neutral feeling. It is a positive feeling demonstrated by our behavior. By this we know what real love is, John says, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brother. So there's a definition of love. To love your neighbor as yourself is to lay down your life, to put someone else's life, to put someone else's interest, to put someone else's good before your own. And again, it's not just this feeling dimension. I have these warm, fuzzy feelings for people. Love is always demonstrated by action, by behavior, by deeds. And that's why John continues in the next verse, and loving your brethren is doing things for your brothers and sisters. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in action and in truth. So, we're looking at love in the midst of a global pandemic. Now, there are further demonstrations of this love in Philippians. We want to go to Philippians 2, and then we'll, we'll look at uh, a few passages in the book of Romans, and we will uh, finish at that point. Philippians chapter 2. Now, Philippians 2 verse 1 says, Paul is saying, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any comfort of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit. And of course, Paul is saying, those things do exist. He's saying we have encouragement, we have comfort, we have fellowship. And the comfort comes from demonstrated love. If there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if there are any affections and acts of compassion, and Paul's assuming they all exist, he's saying, Fulfill my joy that you be like-minded, that you have the same love, that you are united in spirit, that you are focused on the same purpose. And of course, all of this revolves around Jesus. All of this revolves around our focus is on Christ. If our focus is on Christ, if we're loving God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, we will love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, this is neighborly behavior, of course, that Paul is referring to. And then he says, now, here's a, a practical manifestation of all of those things, of that encouragement, that comfort, that love, that spiritual fellowship, that affection, that compassion, that single-minded focus on Jesus. He says, do nothing according to selfish ambition or conceit. Do nothing in terms of self-interest. Our interest is to be other-directed. That's what the two great commandments are. It's directed toward God and it's directed toward others. But rather in humility, Regard each other as being better than yourselves. He says, let each of you look out, not for his right. own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this same mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. To have the mind of the Lord is to not have self-interest. And then the remainder of that passage talks about how Jesus, when he became man in the incarnation, when God became man, God divested himself 
God in Christ, the incarnate God, divested himself of self-interest and did what? Loved his father with all his heart, soul, and strength and loved his neighbor as himself. All right, let's close in Romans 14. Now, Romans 14 is a very unique passage. It is, it is not given the, the central position and the significance that it really ought to uh, in many individuals' theologies. It deals with having different opinions about different matters. The early church had to face this. There were different, different ethnic groups uh, involved in the church, and they, were, they had different histories. They had different experiences. They had different values. They had different practices. They had different traditions. And now this whole church, with all kinds of, uh, of different things being emphasized, is now coming together in Christ. Romans 14 deals with a, a mixed congregation of Jews and Gentiles where some follow kosher laws, eat only certain foods. That would be the Jews. The non-Jews ate all kinds of foods. They didn't have kosher laws. Uh, the Jewish believers celebrated specific feasts, and the, 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 the Gentiles didn't have the same kinds of feasts. And now you're mingling together in Christ and everybody has their practices and everybody has their opinions. Now, people say, well, I, I'm not worried about kosher or non-kosher food or the church today. We're not worried about uh, this feast or that feast, even though we are. Uh, watch, watch how many things are stirred up when some Christians celebrate Christmas and others say it's a pagan feast. I mean, this is closer to reality than we might think. But I want to change the wording here. Paul says in Romans 14, 1, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. And over doubtful things in the Greek is over opinions. We're not to have disputes where the area of opinion is involved. Now, there, there are things in Scripture that are 100% are clear. And there's, there's no doubt that these are cardinal tenets of the faith. But there are a lot of things where we go back and forth with. Do we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Do we baptize in the name of Jesus? Is, is, the, uh, uh, the, are the, is the church caught up before the, uh, the Great Tribulation, or is it caught up after the Great Tribulation? Um, you know, uh, what does it mean that, that women's ministry should be restricted? Well, women shouldn't be restricted from anything. We have all kinds of things that are not what we would call creedal statements. The things that all men everywhere have always believed in the church. Cardinal uh, tenets that determine whether we're saved or not. We're not to have disputes over opinions. One person believes he may eat all things, but he who has a weak conscience eats only certain foods. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received them both. In other words, it's interesting, those who, who eat all foods can despise those who don't eat all foods, and those who just follow kosher food laws uh, can judge those who don't follow those same laws. Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Now let me give this a global pandemic perspective. I'm, I'm going to switch some of the words. Receive the one who struggles to have faith in the same things that you have faith for, and not to enter into disputes over different opinions. One believes the most important thing in this hour is we got to get our economy back. Let's just all go out and not worry about the, 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 the pandemic. Let's just, let's be careful, but let's just get out there. Another one says, I prefer to remain in lockdown. And uh, if I do come out, I, 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 I need to wear a mask. Let not him who favors less strict or less stringent 
rules, despise the one who doesn't. We're in a, 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 a place where we need to say what is best, what is good for my brother and sister, as we are thinking and praying about returning to church. And we pray about what kind of guidelines do we need to follow in going back to church. It shouldn't be, well, this is what's good for me, because that is contrary to everything that is being taught in Mark 12 and 1 John 3, Philippians 2. Let me drop down to the 16th verse of Romans 14. Therefore, do not let what you believe to be a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace, which make for unity. The Lord is one, and we need to be one with each other. Let's pursue the things which make for peace and unity, and the things whereby we may build each other up, strengthen each other, encourage each other. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of your opinion about the pandemic. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats and causes someone else to stumble. Finally, there are so many different opinions on this, this pandemic, the lockdown, the, the, the releasing the restrictions of the lockdown. There, there, there are, are multitudes. And oftentimes they differ based on our own experience. You're, you're in a situation where uh, an individual has had, a, in his entire county, has had 100 COVID cases and three people have died. And you're in the tri-county area uh, of the, the Detroit region in which the death rate from COVID in Wayne County is higher than anywhere in the United States. We cannot assume that my experience is the experience of everyone. That's subjectivism, that's individualism, that's a work of the flesh, that's more being American with our stress on individual liberties and rights than it is being Christian. Here's what I've, what I've been telling everyone, because I've been on national uh, conference calls and, and uh, a brother from New York City is sobbing over the how, how the coronavirus has devastated his congregation. And another brother in, a, in, a, in an area uh, where there hasn't been much is saying, you know, it's, we're trusting God, we're not being afraid, everything's fine. Scripture says this in Romans 12, and I will close with this. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. We need to be considerate of what our other brothers and sisters are going through. If, if the coronavirus has touched people and they've lost people, uh, they have a different perspective from people for whom the coronavirus is not touched. But if we are one body in Christ, we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I thank God for the areas that haven't been as heavily hit, but my prayer is that we sorrow with those for the who have experienced uh, devastation, the areas that have been strongly hit. Verse 16, Paul says, set your mind on the same thing towards one another. If it's true for one, it's true for all. If it's true for one part of the body, the whole body embraces it and receives it. It says, do not set your mind on high things, but associate yourself with the humble. And the implication associating yourself with high things, high-mindedness, is superimposing your own experience on everyone else. Do not become wise in your own opinions. So as we uh, are praying at Lord of the Harvest about regathering and, and, and coming back together, let us keep in mind uh, these principles on love in a global pandemic. God bless you, brethren. Uh, 
thank you for uh, spending time with us. Uh, be at peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>